committee in the hall is back in session. Madam Vice Speaker, you still have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I guess I just want to reiterate that it's very important to me, Mr. Chair, that uh, the body very much consider that, that at this point, you know, in the history of Guam, I think it's very responsible of us to, to, to know what we are going to do with Hotel Wharf. That it's a huge policy decision that the people of Guam should all be involved with because Hotel Wharf is different uh, than all the other assets of the port. And the general manager is correct that, you know, we are trying our hardest not to interfere with the cranes and, you know, how they're going to move the cargo in and out and that they're going to have to use Hotel Wharf. No one's trying to interfere with how they want to use Hotel Wharf, but we very much want to prevent what has happened in very recent history. We don't even have to look very far back to show that they were going to use Hotel Wharf for an exclusive purpose. And that might have been okay because they were going to, you know, shape it up. But now when, when we're putting $14 million into that, the people of Guam are putting $14 million into that, the, the, the tariff payers are putting $14 million into that. I just, actually more, much more because of the, the interest. Um, I just, I, I can't see what is, um, I can't see this as an impediment. I actually see it as our, our duty, and I actually see it as negligence if we don't do something like that because of what we have seen. And I'm not speaking bad about any one person because so we're all liable, you know what I mean? And, and I'm just trying to not, let's not all be liable. I mean, let's all agree that we might have the best general manager at one moment, it changes. We might have the best board at one moment, that changes. We might have great senators. That's changed. So all I'm asking is that this goes on for 30 years. And so for 30 years, I would like that, you know, we're putting a huge investment of money in there. Let's, let's just keep the big policy questions where they belong. And that's with the people of Guam. And that's through this body to decide the big policy questions. And I can't see anybody, and I have not seen anyone interfere with. If the port says, and they're gonna give us a list like they did during the public hearing of, you know, we're gonna use it for, for these three purposes. But at the public hearing, you know, I asked them, what, what promises for use are being made in the Tiger Grant? And they said it was not finalized yet. And even today, there's, it's not finalized yet. And so, I am just very curious. I mean, we need to know, I think, what the uses are going to be, and no one's trying to prevent any specific use, but we're just trying to make sure that this will impact our ability for future industry, and uh, this is the only part of the port's asset that impacts, you know, I mean, I mean it's not the only part, but it, it's one of these where there's so many uh, growth. It's a potential for growth. And so, Mr. Chair, that's, that's why I really believe it is when we are, we are by this bill, not just contracting to give money, but we're contracting even obligations on, the, on the, the government of Guam from not doing things at the port, then I think that this is a very little to ask is that the board at the port is going to let us know, you know, the policymakers know what types of industry are we going to cultivate at this brand new hotel wharf that we are going to build of $14 million. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The motion on the floor is to overrule the decision of the chair. And based on the explanations, and it has never been the intent of the chair to restrict the protection of people's resources in this government. I seriously looked at this as materially different, and I certainly would not like to see the legislation be referred back to the committee without this body taking final action in it and being forwarded should it garner sufficient votes to be able to proceed to the governor's desk. But on, on that particular note, I will rescind the decision of the chair, Senator St. Nicholas. If it's okay with you, I'm gonna proceed back to where we were previously. 
um, on the amendment. There was a amendment to the amendment proffered by Senator Estevez, which would insert the words, the cumulative use of, and then after the word wharf, in excess of one year. Senator Estevez, would you like to close? I believe we completed uh, most of the discussions on that particular amendment. And I would like to offer you the opportunity to close on your amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At this time, I, I'm going to withdraw my amendment to the amendment and let the amendment stand as is. Thank you, Senator Estevez. Anyone else on the amendment that's presently on the floor? Madam Vice Speaker, yes, Senator Sinicholas. Can someone please provide Senator Sinicholas a copy of the amendment? Clerk. The amendment is to add a new section that would read any contract, memorandum of agreement, or use agreement for Hotel Wharf must receive legislative approval. Senator Nicholas, you have the floor on the proposed amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just to clarify, this is adding a whole new section with respect to this language into the measure. Um, you know, uh, a lot of points have been raised by the mover of the amendment that are valid. Uh, however, I, I, I do not disagree with the ruling of the chair previously that the, that the um, amendment is out of place. And, and let me be very, very clear as to why. This bill does two things. This bill amends the statute that governs how the port borrows, and this bill authorizes a borrowing for the port. And granted, the borrowing includes Hotel Wharf, but it includes it within the, content, the context of allowing it to be collateralized for the debt obligation. The, the, the measure does not in any way affect contracts. And this item here was not a part of the original bill that was introduced, and it was not afforded a public hearing. And don't get me wrong, I want to make this very clear. I think that the points raised by the mover of the amend amendment are valid. And I think that a separate piece of legislation that would require um, any contract, memorandum of agreement, or use agreement for Hotel Wharf to receive legislative approval, I think that that would be a very valid um, bill to consider. But I just don't see how it applies to a borrowing authorization. This specific amendment would govern the ability for the port to be able to issue a contract. And the issuance of the debt is completely irrelevant to whether or not this section is included. It's entirely outside the scope of the bill that was originally introduced. And if an amendment were to be introduced to remove Hotel Wharf from being collateralized, that would be something else entirely because it would be attached to the debt. But the contract that is a part of Hotel Wharf is not being used to pay the debt service. The debt service is being paid by the tariffs. If the contract for Hotel Wharf was a part of the debt service, then it would be relevant to the measure. But any contract with respect to Hotel Wharf does not in any way affect the ability for us to go out and secure this financing. So there is a relevance question. And with respect to whether or not we should be attaching what would eff effectively be a rider to a bill that is outside the scope of that bill, I think is something that we need to very, very cautiously tread. Because if we're going to be able to attach riders just because there is an association, we can pretty much attach anything to any future measure. And the whole purpose for us having the rules in place that we do to require that these things are heard is so that the affected parties can all have an opportunity to speak to the measure, not just the port, but anybody else who would be concerned about whether or not the contracts are going to be given X number of years. So um, I appreciate the passion of all, all parties involved. I appreciate the points of the mover of the amendment, but I, you know, granted the chair rescinded his ruling, but I actually agreed with the chair that it was outside of the scope of, of the original bill that was introduced. Um, and that being said, I would, I would be more than interested in supporting this measure as a standalone piece of legislation but I do have reservations attaching it as a piece of this existing bill because of the fact that it is outside of the scope of what was intended with the measure. 
Mr. Chairman. Point of information, Thank Mr. Chair. Thank you very Chair. much, Senator Nicholas. Senator Vice Speaker Talai, you may state your point of information. Thank you very much. But if you refer to page 45, lines 22 through 25 of the bill, they don't just use the hotel war for col collateral. Part of what we are getting our, or this bill proposes to do is rehabilitation of H wharf. And that rehabilitation word, I mean, I could have rephrased my amendment to say, let's spell out what rehabilitation means. Rehabilitation for what purpose? And I think that's very relevant. It's obviously relevant to the people making the Tiger Grant. They want to know exactly what purposes are going, that will be used for after they put in 10 million. We're going to use 14 million. So the rehabilitation, it's not just collateral. It's we are dictating the rehabilitation of Hotel Wharf. And we're kind of being, we're shortcutting here by not specifying the the definition here of rehabilitation. And that's, that's why my amendment is relevant, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Vice Speaker, for your point of information. Senator Tom Adder, you're recognized on the proposed amendment. Yeah. There, there seems to be concern as to, you know, uh, as, as was indicated by the retiring speakers, what all is involved in this rehabilitation. And if really, if you just look up portofguam.com, uh, Tiger Grant, and there's the entire grant application in there. It, it gives you the project highlights of what the rehab, that it's a rehabilitation. It's a project cost of $20 million. It, it provides you a narrative, a description of what all this rehabilitation is. Uh, and so if, you know, if anybody really wants to know what the rehabilitation is, maybe we should take a recess, go to that website, read it, and find out that maybe what the agreement was that was being alluded to earlier was really the agreement with the, um, with the grantor of the $10 million from the federal government as to here's what I'll be responsible for, here's what you'll be responsible for with respect to the rehabilitation as described here in the grant application. And I don't, I, don't, I, I don't think that, you know, you, you are going to rehabilitate Hotel Wharf for a certain specific use. It was already uh, um, uh, stated that we just need to return that particular wharf back into a usable condition, at least that complies with the U.S. Coast Guard uh, standards. And, and that it's going to be for a multiple purpose. You can drive up a cruise ship. You can drive up a ship to drop off brake bulk. You can use, drive up a ship to take uh, aggregate loads and whatnot. But there's not one single use for that port. And I tell you, I think the most important part, here we are, you know, arguing about what we can use Hotel War for. I tell you, the bottom line comes down is we need to get that wharf rehabilitated because the major wharves inside right now probably has a lifespan of about five, five years left probably before we have to undertake the really big one. So, you know, we're kind of getting down and may, maybe we're getting into the weeds more than necessary, but the information is here. I'm disappointed that the port hasn't step forward and said, here, you want to know what it's about? It's right here. I know. You probably were had that in your Point hip pocket in ready to take out. But it's here. And, and I, I don't think we need to get to the point of now, you know how long it takes just to, if, if we have to get a, a contract down through here approved? It takes probably 60 days just to get it through the gauntlet. You know, by then, that train's come and gone. So, I, I you know, I, I think we've got to give a little bit of slack. Point of information, Mr. Thank you, Chair. Senator Adder. Vice Speaker Talai, state your point of information, please. I did download the Tiger Grant because I asked them specifically at the public hearing, what are the purposes of the, what uses we're going to be made of Hotel Wharf. They said that was not finalized yet, but that I could read the Tiger Grant, and I did. And they said this morning again that these, 
the agreement for the 10 million is being finalized. So it's not, it's not yet before us because if it would, that would answer at least what is intended. And I'm not asking any question of the panel, Mr. Chair. And I'm just saying that that's the information that they gave us at the public hearing is the information that we were given this morning. And, and it still does not um, take away from the point that if the board is authorized to make exclusive use agreements, then the rest of the government of Guam is precluded from any other activity at this place where we're investing $14 million. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Speaker, for the point of information. Okay, colleagues, um, this is going to be a suggestion, not a decision on the chair. But I think that I would like to provide as much flexibility for members of the body to be able to pose any questions, remaining questions that you will have for members of the panel. I think the, the discussions with some of these proposed, proposed amendments should be amongst the members of this body and not necessarily be inclusive of the panel members uh, seated before us. So, Senators, if it's okay to proceed in that fashion, uh, after we dispose of Vice Speakers, this particular amendment, because we already moved on it, um, I will open the floor for any additional questions that you have for members of the panel, please, this is an opportunity. I'm gonna ask them to, well, as long as we're discussing any f further amendments that they make themselves readily available uh, at the public hearing rooms, should we need additional information provided to members of the body. But senators, um, I'm gonna proceed in that fashion unless anyone differs significantly in regards to that process. Uh, we're going to dispose of Vice Speaker Talai's amendment that is presently on the floor, open the floor for any additional questions or comments, and then we'll dismiss the panel members, allow them to make themselves uh, available in the public hearing room in case there are any additional specific questions that we need to post to them, and then we'll proceed with making amendments with members on this floor. Okay, with that being said, any further dis discussion on the proposed amendment by Vice Speaker Talai? Senator Stevich, you're recognized. Just, just uh, for the record, just a question for Tina. Does this, would this amendment at all affect the actual process of going out to the market and getting the bond? <clears throat> uh, no, this does not have an effect on the bond. So neither negative or positive? N yeah, no effect. Okay. One other question, and I guess this would be for the Port Authority. Um, actually, it would, would probably be more proper for the board. Does this amendment conflict with existing law under Article 1 of the Port Authority of Guam with regards to the authority that the Port Board has to enter into contracts and leases and um, any other negotiations with other entities or instrumentalities? I mean, I don't know if you could answer for the board, but I, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm just curious. Would we need a, like a notwithstanding clause with this Well, if we're, we're going to look at this language as it is for Hotel Wharf, yes, it would. Um, if, if we're going to keep the port as an autonomous agency, it has been granted these authorities to execute its powers in terms of entering contracts, in terms of lease agreements that it has. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do concur with the original law that the ability of the port is limited up to five years. I mean, I understand we do have the case before the Supreme Court at this time. Uh, we've maintained our position very clearly that we stand in line with the five-year limitation. We came to the legislature early this year to ask for your support in the amicus curiae brief because we do maintain that position. Um, I, I'm as disgusted with YTK as just as anybody else out there. Uh, but, but I think at some point the decision has to be made. Are we going to allow the authority to act as an authority or are we on any particular issue going to interject and extract those powers back to the legislature. We can't be all those things. We either are an autonomous agency of the government or we're not. I, I just find it unfortunate that we're using the vehicle of, of the bond that we need for, desperately need for funding as a mechanism to put other constraints um, on the port. I, I don't understand why this is the focus. Uh, I really don't. It's kind of frustrating for us because we're simply trying to get funding that we need to address critical infrastructure needs and make sure that it's an, it's an acceptable way that we could actually go out on the bond market and, and do something. Uh, debating all these other issues at this point is really taking us off track in, in terms of what our focus and our attention is. I, I, uh, it's unfortunate previous agents of the government acted contrary to the law and that matters before us. Um, 
but at the end of the day, I, we just want to get a clean bond bill through that we can go out and implement these projects that, like I said, we, we so desperately need. Time is not on our side with regards to these issues. And Hotel Wharf is a critical piece of infrastructure. We do need to get it repaired sooner than later because, as Senator Adam mentioned, the bigger issue is coming down the road. Uh, you know, I hope we don't have another major earthquake. Because Mr. Chair, point of order. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to respond point to a order, question. Mr. I'm constantly Chair. being interjected on. Point of order, Mr. Chair. I, I, I believe that there's a specific question for a specific answer. And so uh, us taking us around the bend again, I, I don't, I don't know if it's sure necessary, Senator but Estevez also point of order, Mr. Chair, I believe question. this is our Committee of the Whole, this is our legislative body, I, and I also think that it's we need to body, confer oh the our rules body. of engagement for this Committee of the Whole because oh. it seems for the past couple of days it's very, been very unclear. Thank you, Thank Mr. you. Chair. Thank you, Senator, for stating your point of order. Senator Stavis, did you get your question responded yes, to? Yes. That, thank you, Senator. I appreciate, I appreciate the response. Um, and, and if I could just guess speak on the one speak finally on the amendment on the amendment. And, and I'm a bit torn here because um, obviously I don't want to get in the the way of the autonomous powers of the agency whatsoever but I mean history is very very clear and um, as previously alluded to by the previous speaker my fellow colleague from Zotnia I mean it is true we're not here forever senators can change directors will change boards will change but history is history and I think it, it is very relevant to kind of discuss, even, even if they are redundancies in current law, because as we've seen, at least in one initial ruling, is the courts didn't even care what the current law was, whether it said that we retain sovereign immunity or not. And so I think redundancies and exercising our authority as this branch of government and asserting it every opportunity we can get can protect us from these future and potential, obviously because it's still being deliberated, but these potential liabilities. Because when you look at the potential of a $14 million liability on the port or people of Guam, I'm looking at $14 million out of the 4.2 that could have gone into the rehabilitation of Hotel War rather than having to borrow $14 million, potentially. So, you know, there, I think they're all very relevant. It, maybe it is very unfortunate that this is the mechanism but everything is interconnected one way or another. And we, we always have to, I think it's very important that we think long-term and what could happen and kind of plan for the worst case scenario that while it was alluded to, we might have the best port director in the history of Guam, that's not forever. For, probably not for 30 years. Same thing with the legislature, same thing with the board. We just don't know. Um, so, while, while normally I would probably never advocate for this type of intrusion, I think just because of recent history, I think it's, it's a necessity um, that this body does take a step because I'd rather we, we work through the difficulties and the bureaucracy now because we can find a solution and we can work together and find a way forward to make this process work for both, both of us. But we don't wanna look back when we're footing out a bill, if something goes wrong down the road, thinking I woulda, shoulda, coulda, or I wish we would've did it this way. Because you can't, you can't always change the past, you, or you can't change the past. So um, to you, Mr. Chairman, I, I stand in support of this amendment, um, it, you know, it, with, it, it, with, with great difficulty. This is definitely not, not normally how I would uh, vote on these matters, but I do think it's very, very important. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Stevens. Any other comments on the proposed amendment? Senator Tomada, you're recognized. On the amendment by Vice Speaker Talahi. Not on the amendment. Vice Speaker Talahi, would you like to close? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, I just want to add to the arguments I've already made um, and, and thank all my colleagues for their consideration, at least, of this amendment. And, and, and contrary to the representation that this is an intrusion into autonomous agency. You know, I beg to differ because autonomous agencies that come down and ask for borrowing, they know, just like when they go to PUC, they have to account for every dime that they are going to spend. And I can't see why any autonomous agency would think that they are less accountable to the people of Guam. And that's, 
you know, I'm not here for myself. I'm getting nothing out of the ports, whether they fix Hotel Wharf or not. But I think the people of Guam could very much benefit from what happens at Hotel Wharf or not benefit in the case of what we're experiencing right now in the court system from what the port does with Hotel Wharf. And so, you know, when you, wear, when you weigh that, like autonomy, if they were able to fund this with their tariffs, they could go do that. But they're not doing that. They're asking us to go and borrow and to pay a huge amount of money for 30 years to put that obligation onto the people. So I just think it's such a little thing to ask for when they come in and say they want to rehabilitate to ask for details. And if the details were in front of us, we could have approved those details, but they're not. And I don't blame them for that. They're working it out with the Tiger people. And just like the Tiger people want to, the Tiger grant entity wants to work it out, so should we, the legislature, who's giving more than that entity, we should also want to hold the port accountable. And this current board, they're going to they're gonna be the lucky ones. They get to negotiate with the Tiger entity as to what will be done with the port, hopefully if it gets done within the year. Uh, but it will be all future boards that, get, that have to live with it. And, and that's why, I mean, I think it's very timely that we do this now because if they're going to get the 14 million, if, they're gonna be, if we're going to be lucky in the bond market, and, and no one's trying to prevent the rehabilitation of Hotel Warp. All we're trying to prevent is fiascos from happening in, the, in agreements made by one board versus any other board and protecting that asset for all the people of Guam. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Speaker. The amendment on the floor is to add a new section with the contents, the language to read, any contract, memorandum of agreement, or use agreement for Hotel Wharf must receive legislative approval. Any objections on the proposed amendment? There's a couple of uh, objections signified. All those in favor of the amendment, please signify by raising your hands. Amendment fails. Okay, Senators, I'm going to allow the, uh, our panel members to close with their final comments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if yes. I may. If I, yes, if Senator I, may, Ada. I do have one final question. Oh, I'm so, I, I apologize. Um, no, 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 I was problem. supposed to open the floor for any general questions before we yield to the dismissal of the panel members. Senator Ada, okay. you're recognized. So um, maybe the court can help me understand then. So let's assume then that this bill passes and that gives, and the governor signs it, and that gives you the authorization to then proceed to the next step. What is the next step, and how are these solicitations going in so far as the projects are concerned? How is those going to be accomplished so that we can get the projects off the ground? So that we do not have a Simon Sanchez High School uh, uh, situation uh, as we do today. Thank you very much for the question, Senator Adams. Certainly, assuming all goes well and we, we, we have a successful procurement of the bond and the funds are available, um, we will begin the process of doing the bid announcements for the different projects. Uh, obviously, some that have to start from the very beginning, for example, like an admin facility, we have to go out and procure the engineering work, the design work for the facility. Uh, and get that done and get those things approved once they're completed. And then, of course, that will be a further down the road as far as beginning construction on that facility. Some of the things that can, the more immediate repairs that can be done, of course, is once we can get a contractor on board to do some of the refurbishments in the warehouses. Uh, those things should be able, assuming everything works well and we're looking at maybe March or April of next year for the transfers of those funds, then the part can begin the process of working on the construction bids. Of course, we have to meet those public timelines and announcements, evaluation, and so forth, and then from there, once uh, a, a contractor is identified, then we can commence with the other projects that are listed. But, but maybe more specifically, is who is going to package these solicitations? Well, is, it, is it the engineering staff at the port, or do you have an owner's agent engineer that's already on board for that? 
Maybe you can clarify that. We do have an owner agent on board. Uh, two years ago, again, there was a public announcement to rebid out those services for the Port Authority of Guam. Part of it was to complete the existing modernization projects that we have, and then also to be available for other projects that the port will undertake. Uh, because primarily the owner agent was working on the 1.3 fund, remaining funding from OEA. Uh, but we had also anticipated there would be other projects of repair that would be needed at the port. And so they do have a five-year contract. We have three years remaining on that. Uh, they will be the ones to assist in advising us in moving forward with that. Uh, but the actual uh, compilation of the bid so far, because we do have delegated authority from the Department of Public Works, will be, as it currently now, executed by the port. We currently do all our, uh, our bid projects for construction at the port. Right. Um, yeah, so, so my concern basically is uh, who's going to put the solicitation package together because DPW also does the solicitation, puts together the solicitation packages. And, and I guess what I'm getting at is um, $80 million worth of CIPs, mm -hmm. or actually 40-some no, 40, 40 million okay. dollars. Yeah. Uh, of CIPs um, is quite a bit of additional work on top of what what the day-to-day -to -day work that the current staff has mm -hmm. so normally we would hire um, a, a program management uh, consultant to put the packages together issue it uh, evaluate the uh, responses and all that and I just want to get uh, an idea that that is in fact the kind of scenario that the port is looking at, the same way that GPA and GWA sure. does. That's what they do. Right, and, and that, that's why in addition to our procurement staff, certainly, and as you've, you've been tracking, Senator, in terms of the training and credentials of our procurement staff, uh, we have our OEA agent there to assist us with regards to advising us on that. And also the extra engineering. We do have our own engineering division, but of course for the additional uh, technical, and because it's not a day-to-day -day normal operation for our engineering staff, that's why we do have our, our owner agent there to assist us, as they did advise us. I mean, we had them there to advise us also with regards to the DOD funded projects. So I'd look at this very much as a continuation of that process. The only difference is instead of uh, Merritt, who administrated that project, doing those those portions of, of the project, it will be the port staff with our, with our, our owner agent to assist us in facilitating the construction projects. Because as I mentioned, we currently do now for our other projects, we do have a number of federal grants where we have done construction projects at the port uh, and we have executed those. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Adder, for your questions. Senator Sir Nicholas, uh, Senators, just for your information, open session in terms of any final questions you would like to pose to the members of the panel. We will allow them to make the final comments and I will, as chair of the committee in the whole, continue to request their presence in the public hearing room just in case there's any uh, additional information that may be requested from individual senators. So, Senator St. Nicholas, you recognize. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I first wanted to open up with an observation and that is that um, uh, throughout these past several days, we've been um, well, I've been, I won't want to speak for everybody, but I've been um, under the impression that uh, somehow we needed to rewrite Article 2 in order to allow for um, the port to go out and borrow. But when you step back and look at what we're borrowing for, a large portion of it is to ref refund or refinance existing debt, which means the port has gone out and borrowed. They've gone out and borrowed under the existing Article 2. So the port is able to borrow under the existing law. And I would proffer that if we're able to have the port borrow from local banks under the existing law, it shouldn't be too far of a stretch to authorize them to be able to go out into the bond market under existing law. Uh, that being said, uh, I again raise the question as to why Bond Council is advising us to rewrite all of Article 2. And I wanted to kind of put some key points onto the record because I think it's important for us to very clearly understand bond council. And so I first wanted to pose the question to Ms. Garcia. We have this email from bond council and they provided us with telephone numbers and email addresses. If I were to call them directly, would they answer my questions? Yes, sir, they would. 
Does Bond Council represent the people of Guam, or are they a or is the, the client the um, Guam Economic Development Authority? Um, they do represent. Um, they were engaged by Gita, but they do ensure that um, uh, we are uh, following the laws of Guam. That's not my question, though. Who is the client of? Oric Harrington and Sutcliffe LLP, who are constantly referred to as Bond Council. Who is their client? Uh, Gita is their client. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to, they call it judicial notice in the court system. I guess we can call it legislative notice, but I'd just like to put it on the record that attorneys represent their clients. And the client in this case is Gita. And if we're going to be rewriting the bond borrowing statute, based on, as per their own email, a great deal of thought and input from Gita, the port, underwriters, their council, meaning the underwriters council, and bond council, nowhere were the um, legal advisors of the people of Guam involved. It was the attorney for the bond underwriter and it was the attorney for the Economic Development Authority I even overheard a question by one of our colleagues asking why didn't you come and ask our legislative council to be involved in this drafting. And it's, it needs to be put on the record that of course Gita incurs a fee for when we float debt, so they have an interest in, in having as fluid a bond borrowing process as possible. But also for the record, does bond council receive compensation when we float additional debt? Yes, they do. And so, Mr. Speaker, I mean, Mr. Chairman, it just needs to be made very plain that if we're going to be having the parties that, are, that stand to get compensated by a more amiable borrowing environment, we need to understand that that borrowing environment is being, may, I'm not going to make the direct accusation, but may be being structured in the interest of those who want to be able to continue making the process happen. And so I wanted to predicate my statements with that clear understanding on the record. Uh, may I ask you to consider one point? Sure. Bond Council also has a fiduciary responsibility to SEC that um, their advice is they're, they're here to provide assistance and help us bring to you a package that complies with uh, municipal rules and then we have local council to make sure and whether again whether it's the port council uh, Gita's council or the AG all of them are involved and um, absolutely no problem um, inviting legislative council to participate. Now, I, I appreciate the clarification because when you say that the AG is involved when the governor signs off on documents or actually doing of this legislation is we're removing the governor from the process. And so, in effect, we're therefore removing the AG from the process. That's another part of what's happening here in Article, in, in Section 1, the entire revision of Article 2. In addition, as you correctly state, Bond Council has a fiduciary responsibility with respect to the SEC and the rules and procedures governing the issuance of bonds. But who has a fiduciary responsibility to the people of Guam? I know Gita is not, the, the Gita officials aren't even considered fiduciaries. And so that is why the involvement of the legislature, at the very least, in the issuance of public debt is so critical because we are the fiduciaries, at the very least. And so on, on that whole basis, I wanted to present uh, several um, facts with respect to the legislation that I'm hoping my colleagues can, can follow me through. Now earlier, Mr. Chairman, it was stated, uh, and this is starting on page 25, it was cited on lines 20 and 21, pursuant to section 50103K, chapter 50, title 12, Guam Code annotated, the board through the Guam Economic Development Authority has the power and is hereby authorized, and then goes on to what they're authorized for, pursuant to section 50103K. Now I pulled out 
50103K, Chapter 50, Title 12, GCA. And this is the Guam Economic Development Authority statute. This was what was referenced earlier when Gita said that any bonds that are floated need to come before the legislature before they're approved. And the specific section that Gita referenced, the statute is actually not very um, well organized. It's a huge paragraph, but in the middle of the paragraph it reads, the corporation, meaning Gita, shall not issue or sell any bond without the approval of Viles Latura of the terms and conditions of the bonds. Now on the surface, it looks like that sentence would ensure that all bonds come before this body. But actually what it specifies is that they shall not issue or sell any bond unless the legislature approves the terms and conditions. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, what happens in this statute is that we are abdicating the need for us to approve those terms and conditions to the board. And if my colleagues can follow um, how this all aligns, on page 25, that same section, it continues to read, in addition to an ampl ampl amplification of all other powers conferred upon the board by Jose D. Leon Guerrero C Commercial Port Act or any other provisions of this chapter or by any law of Guam or of the United States, but subject to the requirements of Title 12, GCA, Section 12116, Emphasis added, Mr. Chairman, to exercise any or all of the powers granted to the board by this article. That particular part of the section states that we are granting the powers to the board pursuant to this article. Now, what are those powers? Right on to the next sentence, it reads, the board through the agency of Gita may at any time or from time to time authorize the authority to incur indebtedness. So we're authorizing the board, we're giving them the superseding power, and in the next sentence, they are able to authorize the authority to incur indebtedness. Now if you follow that, Mr. Chairman, to page 28, starting on line five, section 10208 title reads, indenture providing, emphasis added, terms and conditions of bonds. Terms and conditions of bonds. And I reference this right back to that 50103K chapter 50, the Gita statute. The corporation shall not issue or sell any bond without the approval of the terms and conditions of the bonds. But in this act, we are giving the, the, the board superseding authority, which it can thereafter delegate to the authority, which is the management of uh, the port. And they, it reads, the authority may enter into indentures, and then it lists that they may enter into indentures, setting those terms and conditions. Because we're passing this statute with these kind of dots that connect, and I may, perhaps we should ask legal counsel for their opinion and recess until we get a very clear answer, but it is my interpretation that while Gita would be required to come back to us to approve the terms and conditions, we are in advance saying that the board can give the authority the ability to determine those terms and conditions. And if we abdicate that one sentence to the board and to the authority, they don't need to come back here. And it just becomes further curious when you just reference, when, I, when you go back to those other sections that I referenced back in Monday, I think it was Monday, page 37, lines 12 to 14. This lien shall arise automatically without the need for any action or authorization by Magalahin Guahan, the government of Guam, the authority, or any other person or entity. And if you just continue on to the next sentence, such lien shall be valid and binding from the time bonds are issued. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm just 
And perhaps I, I, at this time, um, in line of the responses that we've received from Gita and this information provided, I think it would be prudent for us to just clarify with legal counsel whether or not what I'm, what I'm interpreting this, this language to read actually would be in effect. And I just wanted to, um, prior to making that motion, I wanted to close by once again referencing the email from Gita. When they say, the bond counsel to Gita says that the provisions are intentionally, intentionally consistent with and modeled after Guam code annotated provisions for other Guam autonomous agencies, in particular, Guam Waterworks Authority. A Guam Waterworks Authority does have elected representation with respect to the approval of its debt, and that's through the CCU. This language and its abdication of the involvement of Lesotura would no longer involve any elected officials. And if there are no, elect no involvement of any members of Lesotura, and if Lesotura is the only body to serve as a fiduciary on behalf of the people of Guam, who is looking out for the people if we pass this section one? Who is looking out for the people with respect to any future indebtedness that may occur without the involvement of Ilesotura? And so if that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to, um, with your discretion, make a motion that we uh, um, consult with our legal, our legal counsel, the legal counsel of Ilesotura, as to whether or not this language may or may not result in an abdication of our involvement in the approval of indebtedness prospectively and inclusive of, of this act for the Port Authority of Guam. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator St. Nicholas, on your point. And if I can ask you to confer with legal counsel, and I will give you an opportunity to be able to present uh, their legal guidance as it applies to some of your statements. Uh, just, just so that we can recognize the either direct or indirect involvement of the legislature, we do have the opportunity to be able to confirm the board members when they come to this legislature. And like was stated a little earlier, the chair is willing to accept any amendments that would clarify and reinsert the participation of the legislature as well as the office of Imagalahi and Guahan into any consideration for indebtedness or bond financing. Uh, any further general comments coming from the members of the body? Senator St. Augustine, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to ask the port folks, in the event this bill does not pass, what is going to start happening? What's going to, what is the course of action the port will be taking to, to get the rehabilitation going and getting well, us all settled? Well, Senator, certainly thank you for the question. I think one of the most critical issues that we would want to address is our share of the financing for Hotel Wharf. Um, you know, that, that Tiger Grant has a shelf life, and it's not indefinite. And um, as I'm scrolling to catch up on my email at the office, I have an email from Dave Bonnet from Merritt asking me exactly what's the status of where the port is with regards to the financing so that we can move forward with the uh, formal agreement so that we can begin the process of... Um, actually moving forward with the rehabilitation of Hotel Wharf. Uh, that I would think it would be most critical. I do not want to risk for the future of the port, for the future of our ability to obtain other federal grants because we have quite had a substantial amount of federal money that's come to the port through our port security grants and other type of grants, also through the Department of Interior to address repairs to our yard, our security system, um, our marinas. I will not want to jeopardize that. I think we'd be idiots to lose a $10 million gift, essentially, from the federal government. Um, I will go to the PUC, as I will go to my board before then, and I will ask for that assistance. I think one way or the other, if, if the legislature chooses not to move forward with this legislation or we're not able to successfully move this through the bond market, I do have to look for an alternative to identify how we can get the funds that we need. Uh, PUC may decide to address additional increases to the rates in order to cover this because these problems, you know, infrastructure is tangible. And if we don't address the repairs, it's going to continue to deteriorate. And I cannot in good conscience, knowing what I know in the work environment that a number of our employees in the yard are subjected to, even in addition to Hotel Wharf and, and, and Golf Pier that we've discussed, 
I cannot continue to allow our employees to work in those conditions and not address their safety when we know that these are, are really real problems. So that will be my action. I, I will go to the board and ask their, their approval and I will go to PUC to look at other options that we can address to address the financing. The hope with this bond was to take that debt and move it over a longer period of time so that the impact will be less. Uh, but I can't sit and do nothing. I, I just, not in good conscience, can sit and do nothing with um, the current conditions that these facilities are in. I, I think we will jeopardize the capability in some areas, particularly with regards to our water line. Uh, I have seen fragments, of course, when they have, um, we've had these water leaks, Senator, and for those of us at the port that have seen it, in some cases what's holding that water line together is the, the gravel outside. I mean, the pipes are corroding. Um, we put ourselves in a situation of being shut down by the U.S. Coast Guard because we cannot meet our full firefighting suppression requirements. Um, these are the realities that we're dealing with, and the sooner we can work on putting a new water line in place and getting that more immediate issue addressed, the better for all of us. I mean, if we stop commerce, if the, port, if the U.S. Coast Guard shuts us down a day, two days, I mean, you're talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars that will be incurred by our carriers. Uh, that will be transferred to ultimately to, to, to our people that receive these commodities. So um, that's what I will do. That's what the port more than likely will do to address what other options do we have available to, to find the money that we need uh, to address these critical repairs. We're opening ourselves up to other liabilities. We're opening ourselves up to other potential suits as well, uh, especially if we have knowledge as we do, for example, with Gulf Pier and what happens if we have another earthquake and that pier becomes inoperable? I mean, a significant amount of our fuel supply will be affected. And yes, we can probably run that through F1, but at the end of the day, that's still going to slow down the process under which our community receives uh, you know, these fuel resources. So they're tangible realities. I mean, if this is not the vehicle, if this gets bogged down for whatever reason, um, we have to move and look for other things. And I would hate that the option would be an additional rate increase to our consumers that has to be taken up front rather than financing and working it over a period of time so that that cost would be lessened. Because, Senators, as we mentioned, this is only the beginning. Uh, if we got another 10 years with the service life extension projects, optimistically we hope another 15 for the main, main wharfs and the yard. Um, if we don't start now, that, that problem is going to compound itself. And when sections of those wharfs become inoperable because of uh, deterioration, uh, because there's another factor, those vessels will not come in unless our, our, our wharfs are insured. And if we can't meet the requirements for insurance, they will not come in. They will not come in because of their own liabilities that they have to worry about. They're not going to bring their vessels in to, to wharfs that um, are not stabilized and not in proper use. They just legally will not do it. And, and those re I'm not doing it to fear. I mean, I will not be at the port at the time when these problems happen, but uh, they will come. That's, that's what's ahead of us. And we need to start now because uh, we've got some bigger issues to tackle in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, in order to keep commerce moving, because there is no other alternative. I mean, even with all the upgrades and improvements the military has done across the harbor, they don't have our cranes. So it will slow down and limit the, the movement of cargo coming into the island. Senator Th uh, th Thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure everybody heard it. Senator Tom brought that up. What are your steps if it's passed? Now we all heard exactly what we could all be facing if it doesn't pass. I just wanted to make sure that was very clear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator St. Augustine. Uh, anyone else have any general questions or inquiries to make to members of the panel before we dismiss them? I do, Mr. Chair. Oh. Vice Speaker Talai. I just wanted to ask Ida, what, when they say um, we're going to borrow $72 million with uh, in interest rate up to 6.5 percent what what are we going to pay in third what are we going to pay over 30 years what is the total um, can I get back to you I have to look through some um, older notes give me a moment 
Sure. And um, I just want to clarify that the, the port represented to us during this these proceedings that uh, for additional repair not included in this revenue bond, not listed as one of the projects in this revenue bond, that it may have to seek increased tariffs for other projects and or, or other measures, right? Cut down costs. I mean, they didn't mention that, but I'm sure that they will consider that too. Um, I guess I just wanted to clarify one more time what is the status of the the PUC made it a requirement that or like a separate requirement that the gantry cranes would be repaired so could you just remind us the status of the gantry crane repair and that repair fund that's being set aside for that you're talking about specifically gantry three that we discussed during the public hearing because uh, originally we had hoped to put that in this bond uh, financing but it was recommended because we have a separate source for the replenishment of that i believe alfred it's a little less than about six million right now oh, okay so a little over five not quite six million dollars and so that amount is not the full amount that's needed. It's almost 50 percent of what would be needed again we won't know ultimately until the uh the bid goes out um, but we would again have to, to come back to the PUC to address the remaining funding to procure a new gantry crane to replace gantry crane three so that we have four fully operational gantry cranes, which is something our carriers uh, would also like to see. Right. And then when you talked about Merid uh, corresponding with you while you were here, do you have a draft agreement that you, uh, you're reviewing? We currently do have a draft agreement that we're working on. Uh, we recently provided them, because things that they're asking us, for example, are like the timelines um, for each step. Uh, they've also requested, because as I mentioned, they were here in September, that we begin the NEPA process with regards to the environmental requirements so that we can facilitate that, because they will not finalize an agreement with us until we've addressed all the NEPA requirements for the uh, rebuilding of Hotel Wharf. And so essentially it sets the timelines and parameters because we, we only have several years collectively from the time the clock starts, so to speak, with the agreement until the project has to be fully implemented and in place. Uh, and each step of the way, they will continue to watch our progress because the actual grant is on a reimbursable uh, nature. Uh, as we finish each phase, we will provide you know, the, the evidence of the work and what has been met to those requirements to uh, DOT, and it's from there that they will release the funds to the port. So that, that's how the agreement will be structured. And it's really a formal agreement on how we are to go about that process for the construction. That's ultimately really what it's, it's for. If you could provide, I understand it's a draft, but whatever draft language that it is that you're considering at this point in time, and I know it's it may change based on what what I, I mean we could share that with the oversight built. I mean it is a draft document mm -hmm. and I mean it's not finalized I mean I think when it does it becomes something that again is formal and something that can even be foiled uh, I mean I just don't think it's something we would put out at this point for general circulation but if, if you'd like a draft copy or a chair would like a draft copy but it is still a draft it is not an official finalized legal document of I either understand I totally understand or, the, or, or DOT you can stamp draft all over it I want I just want to get an idea what you know of the details that we are considering and everybody I think we're very no one's a stranger here to grants. I mean, grants always come with strings, and I just kind of want to know what exactly those might be. I do and I understand. I do want to clarify. There are no strings attached other than our ability to formally deliver the construction of Hotel Wharf according to our application of what we had applied for. So it, it's going to be to outline what the timelines are, mm -hmm. what steps. As I mentioned, one of the most critical requirements up front that they want to see from us is the completion of the National Environmental Policy Act requirements. Mm -hmm. Uh, how, we need to fulfill how, that how are uh, you, before they will finalize. Are you going to do that like, um, as a, in accordance with the federal NEPA? Yes? We have to meet all those. Yes. I mean, okay. we will meet all local and federal requirements with regards to the uh, rehabilitation of Hotel Wharf, as we would any other construction project. Those requirements are legally in place, and we would have to meet them already. When, you, when you're using federal money, right? Well, but also yeah. if we're, mm -hmm. we're using non-federal money, I mean, I... <clears throat> All right. You know, there Mr. was a time Duenas? I was an EPA. We would still have to, if it, if it triggers, it depends on the parameters of the project. I mean, we still have to work with Army Corps because it affects our waterway issues. Mm -hmm. 
So we would still have to go through all those requirements, local and federal, with regards to the environmental issues to ensure that the project is in compliance with that. Thank you. Mr. Dreams? Uh, one of the biggest reasons why the agreement is uh, still in draft form is that there is a local requirement by DPW and the building permits that says all the, app, all the required licenses and approvals have to be within one year of the application to the building permit. So uh, in the process of uh, 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 getting our drafts and everything else completed, we have completed the application for, for NIPA. It's, it's there, it's on the desk, and we're just waiting for the commitment of the funds to be made. Then we can send up because the plans and specifications for the projects are already done. And again, those have to be within one year. They are not signed because the date has to be within one year of the application for the building permit. So once, once we get the commitment and everything else that the funds are ready, uh, we would sign off on all of them. We would sign off and send the NEPA application out. Uh, and the NEPA application, uh, we work in tangent with uh, uh, the Tiger people to make sure that our response and everything else would minimize the waiting period at the, at the agencies and would lead to a quick review and, uh, and a positive response. So we, we've done our homework on it. We, we are ready for it. And uh, once we get it going, then, well, we would have that one-year period for, for these uh, approvals to come back, and then we go up and uh, uh, apply for the application, building permit. Great. Um, well, thank you. I just think that, yeah, seeing that would maybe alleviate some of our concerns, if that's really the case. So I, I would like to see that. I've been asking for some of that information since the public hearing. But I also want to know, can you also just tell us, um, I received some calls of concern from users of the marinas that uh, the marina marina repair is not included as one of the projects in for this revenue bond. And however, you know, they have been given notice and the public has been giving notice that uh, the port intends to raise the fees on the marinas and I was just looking at it very carefully, I mean, quickly and in some cases, yeah, $100 increases and I re understand I read the whole report by captain and associates the appraisal or their recommendations that fees for marinas have not been raised in many many years but I also understand the port has benefited from you know some grants to repair these marinas over the years and uh, the, the the main reason why the fees fees are not uh, have not been increased because every time the port notifies the tenants that we're going to increase the fees they come to the legislature and that request is, is, what, is, is this, what is the status? I mean, you gave a notice that you were going to and that you were going to uh, wait for PUC to quote a hearing. What is the status of that? Uh, the, the, the status of the, of the fees and everything else obviously would go to uh, PUC for their approval. Now, if, if you look at the proposed fees and everything else, the fees in the uh, Aganya Marina is, is more drastic than the fees at the Agate Marina. And, and the reason yes. for that is when we uh, did the fees for the Agate Marina, the tenants were satisfied with it. When you go to the Aganya Marina, there, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, yeah, but there's been many, many years. But I just want to know, what is the status? I know I saw the announcement in the newspaper that you're going to raise this and that some of these were over $100. Yeah. And I just want to know, what is the status? Where is it at PUC There's a now? statutory requirement after we it's file PUC. with PUC. There's a Have they set a hearing? Uh, that's what we're waiting for. All right. Do you have any expectation? I mean, do you guess what that would be? Uh, we're, we're, it, so we it just could wait be. for them to let you know when the yeah. hearing on that will be? Right. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Speaker. Any additional comments or questions? I just wanted to check with Gita if they had that information on the total. Ms. Uh, if we borrow $72 million at 6.5%. Over 30 or 25 years, whichever one. So if um, uh, best case scenario, um, if we go 30 years, we're looking at a total cost of um, 135 mil with the highest at 150 mil, so depending on what the final debt service is. So your um, interest costs over for this 
uh, bond can go anywhere from 62,500 to um, as high as 80 mil. That's just your interest cost. And again, that's to fund the project fund at 65 mil. Thank you. And the debt service that we're looking at, if we go with the terms and uh, the maximum? Uh, maximum, I mean, maximum debt service right, right now is uh, 6 million. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Delahi. Any other questions or general comments for members of the panel? If not, I'm going to request the executive manager as well as the representative from Gita for any final comments. But before they close, only because I have a couple of amendments before me, one is dealing directly with the application of the fees that Gita would otherwise generate to provide improved access and use of beaches and marinas. If I can ask the board representatives to provide a response to that. And then the other amendment Mr. is- Mr. Chair, I thought yes. you said we were gonna- No, 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 only I wanna- Discuss our, I would like to- Only because I have I'm, the proposed amendments before my me. Motions, no, only because I have I the like proposed amendments those. before me that I'm asking if they can respond to it at this point in time. And but the there's other been one, no questions on them, Mr. The other Chair. one, uh, Senators, is regarding a possible environmental impact statement. So I just wanted to ensure only because, like I said, I do have these amendments before me, and uh, I, I think Mr. It would Chair, be we're going to discuss the amendments. Then I would like to propose the amendments, but you told us to hold off on the amendments and only ask questions that we needed answered and that we would discuss the amendments separately. So I guess I want to know. We are discussing the amendments separately. I just asked, I'd like to I just ask that if these concerns the or these make amendments the are proffered, that at least they are able to be given an opportunity to comment in their closing comments. Well, then that's could it. I please propose my amendments if that's what you're going to do, Mr. Chair? It's the discussion was to allow for open discussion by senators and then to proceed and allow the panel members to provide closing comments and request they continue to remain available for any members of the, sen of the Senate that would like to ask, ask questions with regards to certain issues in the public yes. hearing room. I have one more question, and Mr. Chair, if yes. I may. Senator I wanted to know Talai, if, you recognize. If, um, if, for example, from the figures that were given to us by Gita, if the port believes that this is consistent with their application to PUC for the tariff increases that they would be able to afford the six million dollar debt service. Was that what the port, I mean the PUC um, was calculating also or that you would be, a, that you are able to cover the six million dollar debt service with the current tariffs? Uh, yes, we uh the repayment and everything else is based on the on the maximum of uh, uh, 80, 80 million dollars, and uh, the the tariff itself uh, would take care. Uh, the tariff rate, as approved, uh, would take care of the uh, would be sufficient to cover the repayment. To cover debt service in the amount of six million. No, no, in the right in the in the annual amount of six million. Okay, Th that is correct. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Vice Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Duenas. Uh Just closing comments from the panel members. I will withhold any, uh, I'm sorry, Speaker Cruz, you had your hands raised? Yes, I, I just want one clarification from Gita. Did I hear you correctly on the cost of the borrowing? The 6.5% would, would mean interest by itself would be $141 million. But for some reason, you seem to have subtracted the principal from that and said it's actually only going to cost us 68, but it's not. So um, I can, I'll share with you my worksheet uh, with the chairman, but basically we told you $6 million debt service would be our, our uh, worst case scenario, 25 years. Total cost would be $150 million you remove the 65 mil project fund that comes to an interest cost of 85 mil. And again, that's um, a non, that's why I gave you the range. That's the non-investment grade. 
if we get investment grade, um, then we can bring that, um, again, it, these are just um, estimates. If we get investment grade, we hope to bring that debt service down to as low as uh, 5.1 mil for 25 years. So that's how we came up with the numbers. And again, I don't have, um, this is what our market was running at at the time. Yeah, I'm just having problems with subtracting the, the, the uh, principal because it would seem to me that the interest by itself, the interest cost is the 141 on top of the 60, uh, on top of the 76. Um, so again, um, it's a simple calculation. If we get non-investment grade for 25 years, 6 million times 25 years, and then, and we, we show that in our um, documents, 65 million of that will be used for projects. The rest is your interest costs. All right. Um, I have issue, but we'll move on. Any other questions or comments from members of the floor? If not, if I can ask uh, some final comments from members of the panel, and then we'll proceed. Mr. Chair, I just yes, have, Senator Nelson. I, just, just for clarity, we're we're talking about seventy-two point six million dollars to go out for the bond because of the additional loans that they currently have to cover, and so sixty-five million dollars of that is going to be used for projects on top of the. 141 million in interest, is that what that is? So um, the numbers I have is a $65 million project fund, which is the loans, refinancing, okay. and the, um, the capital improvement projects. Okay. And so, you know, we can... And then you said how much it would be, in, the interest would be at 141 mil? Did I that? Uh, no. So, again, non-investment grade. Yes. Our debt service for 25 years would be six million dollars, um, which comes to a total cost after the 25 years of 150 mil. Of that 150 mil, 65 mil is to pay the original bond, of uh, original borrowed amount of 65 mil. The balance is our interest cost of 85 mil. So the interest will be 85 million. Yes, interest cost. Thank you very much, Senator Nelson. Any further questions or comments from the floor? If not, I'm going to take a five minute recess, Senators.
Good, after good afternoon, Senators. Committee on the whole is hereby uh, reconvened. Uh, there's been a, a request for some additional information before amendments are proffered with representatives of the port. So I'd like to uh, honor that request by a number of our colleagues. Senators, we will be recessing until 1030 tomorrow morning. 1030 tomorrow morning. Thank you, Senators.